Oh my God, so many loved ones. It's amazing. Yo, I'm like, real quick, I'm born and raised from DC and this is absolutely a milestone for me. And to see so many familiar faces and loved ones and new faces, um, just, I'm really excited to be here and thank you all for being here so much. Um, like I said, this is, this is a milestone for me. Um, to be perfectly honest, I'm just at the beginning of my development in my career and being here with you all today is really proving and sort of demonstrating to me that I've got a, a viable shot at being successful at what I want to do. You see, I've, I've chosen a profession that I would say most parents wouldn't be too thrilled to hear their kids are pursuing. I'm trying to look at my mom over there in the back. <laughs> you see, I am an artist. And not like a sexy digital artist that can make animations for Pixar. I am an oil painter. Super old school. I tell people that and they look at me and they're like, what? People still do that these days? And yeah, people still do that these days. Let me show you what I mean. Hey, hey, that's my presentation, but that's what I want to show you. That is a photo of me in 2019, um, painting on a hillside in a town called Giverny in the north of France. Uh, Giverny is known for being where French Impressionist King Claude Monet uh, spent a significant part of his career working uh, and, and living. Uh, some of his most famous works he did in his home and in the gardens that he built in Giverny. Quick story about Monet. Whenever he wanted to paint in the fields, around his home in Giverny. Uh, he would take his easel, he would pack up his art supplies, and then he would march all seven of his kids out into the landscape with him, making each one of them carry a giant canvas for him to paint on. Now, unlike Monet, I don't have a squadron of offspring to carry my stuff for me, but like Monet, as you can see, I'm the kind of artist that'll take an easel, my art supplies, a canvas, and drag it all up a hill to paint a view that inspires me. What, what I'm trying to get at is that almost all of my work comes from observing the visible world around me. I don't create from imagination or memory. I paint what I see. I have a lot of practice doing this, and I've been fortunate enough to work with some fantastic mentors, and I'd like to share with you all today um, some of the insights I've gained from that experience. So the first thing I'd like to discuss is a little bit of color theory. I'm going to take you all back to second grade for a second. Um, the first thing you need to know, there are three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And they're known as the primary colors because they're responsible for creating all of the colors that we know. If, if you, every color that we see in the world is just a different combination of the three primary colors. So as uh, an artist, when I want to work out on the landscape, I can't bring thousands of tubes of paint with me. I have to become, I can't, I can't bring thousands of tubes of paint to get all the hues that I might see in nature. I have to be skilled at mixing the multitude of color that I might see from just a select few. So the primary colors are really important to my work. If you take any two primary colors and mix them together, you'll get what's known as a secondary color. So for example, purple. Purple is a secondary color that is the result of mixing red and blue. And when you look at purple, you can see the hues of red and blue living inside it simultaneously. Orange is another example of a secondary color that is the result of mixing yellow and red. And finally, you could probably see where this is going. Green is an example of a secondary color that comes from mixing yellow and blue. So when we look at all the secondary colors, we can see that there are two primary colors living inside them at the same time. Now, to make sense of how the primary colors and the secondary colors all relate to one another, we look at a color wheel. So this is a photo of the very same color wheel that my mentor in France, Alan Roberts, used to teach me color theory when I was his student many years ago. And if you look inside the wheel, there's a triangle, and the points of the triangle point to each of the primary colors. So up top, we have primary blue. In the bottom left, there's primary yellow. And in the bottom right, there's primary red. And that is all oil paint straight from the tube, not mixed with anything else. 
So those are the pigments we use to represent the primary colors. And all the colors on that wheel there come from just those three colors. So all those oranges along the bottom, that is just different amounts of that primary yellow on the left with that primary red. And we can recognize with our vision that the oranges towards the left have more yellow in them and the oranges towards the right have more red in them. One of my favorite things about this color wheel is that it doesn't try to distinguish the exact point where red stops being red and becomes purple. It doesn't delineate boundaries between the colors. It doesn't put them in a box. And that's really important because color is relative. We perceive color based on the colors that it contains and the colors that we see around it. And instead of colors being specific hues, colors are more like ranges of hues that melt and interact with one another and connect. To explain what I mean by colors relative, if I were to explain, if I were to describe to you all the color on the very right of this wheel, sort of like right at three o'clock on the wheel, I could call that a very red purple, or I could say that it is a red that is beginning to skew in the direction of blue, or a red that contains blue in it. And both of those would be accurate. So that's kind of what I mean by color is relative. There are ranges of hues that, that involve and um, interact with one another. It's easy to understand when we're looking at it neatly arranged on a wheel like this, but what about when we're looking at a subject that we're trying to paint? Let's go back to our friend Kermit the Frog for a second. Hey. So follow along closely with your eyes while listening to what I say, and I'll break it down for you slowly. We all know that Kermit is green. There's no denying that Kermit is green. And, but it's, in art, it's not about what we know up here. It's about what we perceive with our senses. So one person might say that the green of Kermit's torso is just a darker shade of the same green as Kermit's head. But what I think is more accurate to what we're perceiving is that the green of Kermit's torso is a green that contains more blue relative to the green of Kermit's head, which contains more yellow. If I were to paint Kermit's portrait and I were to start on the rightmost edge of Kermit's face just, be just beneath his eye, I would need to mix a green that contains a significant amount of yellow and just a tiny bit of blue. And if I move leftward across Kermit's face, just past the midpoint of his upper lip, the green of his face becomes progressively more and more blue. If I go leftward even more, it becomes yellow a little bit just before becoming a dark dimple. I'm walking you through all this because I want you to sort of experience the observations that I'm making constantly as I'm doing my painting. It's, it's, <laughs> Anyways, I think that's enough for Kermit right now. So when I wanted to start teaching art, I began working with another mentor here in Washington, D.C., named Michelle Cobb. And Michelle spent a, the bulk of her career as a graphic designer with Time Life Books and went on to become the first African-American art director for Sports Illustrated magazine. And when I crossed paths with her, however, she was in her current role as head of the art department at Georgetown Day School, a co-ed independent school right here in Washington, D.C. that uh, made a short appearance in the news recently. What was really incredible about meeting Michelle was that her background in art was strikingly similar to mine. She is also an oil painter, and the bulk of her experience also comes from working in the landscape, observing the visible world around her. And when I started teaching part-time with Michelle and her colleagues at Georgetown Day School, I was blown away by something she tells her students when it comes to this very topic of seeing color and mixing color. She has a rule for them, and that rule is don't name the color. Don't name the color. Some of you might be wondering, how, how is that supposed to help the student? And let me reassure you, it's not that severe. She's not going to give someone a lower grade just because they accidentally say blue in class one time. But by saying, don't name the color, she's trying to help her students get past their 
preconceived notions of what color an object may be or what a certain color may look like and engage their vision, look beneath the surface of the color to see what it contains and what makes it the color that it is. Now, we just saw this with Kermit the Frog. Like I said, we all know that Kermit is green. There's no disputing that Kermit's green. He even wrote a song about it. But it's almost not fair or adequate because there's so much going on in that green. And what's more is that it's not up to us to determine what's going on in that green. We have to set aside our preconceived idea of what green looks like and observe and witness everything that's happening in the green that Kermit is showing us. This is when I started to realize that there's a parallel between Michelle's painting rule of don't name the color and our sort of human autopilot tendency to act or pass judgment based on assumption and bias. If you Google the definition of prejudice, this is what you'll see. Prejudice, preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. That last part, actual experience, is really important. And that's when I started realizing that our work as painting instructors is to help students become aware that their mind can adulterate their perception. And we're there to help them gain practice deliberately pushing past that and engaging their senses and what they're perceiving from their actual experience of the world. This is something I like to call non-judgmental observation. I have a lot of practice with non-judgmental observation from, from all my, my years of painting, and I believe that it has implications that can reach far beyond the canvas. Now, we could have a field day discussing all the ways that non-judgmental observation appears in different creative processes or different art forms or the implications it has in fighting different forms of discrimination or how it's parallel to Dr. King's quote of judge not by the color of one's skin but by the content of one's character. But I only have you for a couple more minutes. So I'd like to emphasize, the next time you're meeting someone for the first time or even just interacting with your neighbor and you think you have them figured out and you think you know their color, Stop. Stop thinking for a second and take a breath. <sighs> Open up your senses, observe, listen, and give them a chance to show you everything that composes who they are. And if you want to build this capacity, if you want to strengthen this muscle, I highly encourage you to take an art class. All human knowledge comes from the senses, and the senses are what connect us to the world and to the present moment, the only place where life is truly available. So it's really important that we gain practice exercising being attentive to what our senses are perceiving. Painting and drawing, of course, exercises our sense of vision. Um, learning to play a musical instrument exercises our ability to listen and hear. Uh, learning to throw pottery on a wheel exercises our sense of touch and cooking exercises our senses of taste and smell. And it's not about learning to make the perfect bowl of chili. It's not about learning to make, paint the perfect portrait or prove that you're talented. Art classes are some of the only opportunities that we have to put all of our attention into what our senses are bringing us without our minds getting in the way. I'm sharing this with you today because I believe this human capacity to non-judgmentally observe is one that is too often overlooked when we're discussing the fight against prejudice. We rely on policymakers and lawyers and entrepreneurs and teachers and nurses to understand all the intricacies of society and how it operates on an intellectual level to make it more equitable for everyone. But I think we need to do more work on ourselves on an individual level internally and with our interactions with our neighbors and peers. So if there's 
one thing we can do, one thing we can practice to get past our own preconceived opinions, our own prejudice, and better connect with the world and each other, don't name the color. Thank you so much.